you would have seen diet fits and it's a study out of Stanford, but there's, there's a bunch of different like meta analyses comparing different diets. And obviously there's the, um, sort of two opposing models, I guess the energy balance model and the carbohydrate insulin model that different research groups have kind of put together as ways of explaining, you know, what is, is causing an increase in energy intake and weight gain. Um, and what I find really interesting is that when you, and, and I'm sort of extending, adding on to what you just said then about not needing any more weight loss trials, is that when you look at these trials that are comparing like a low carb diet with a low fat diet, I think in the short term, there does seem to be some benefit from low carb, like in the first six months, there's a little bit of a benefit there. But then when you get to, to 12 months or two years, on the aggregate, the weight loss is very similar. And uh, we see adherence seems to be a problem. Um, but Diet Fits did this beautiful waterfall water plot. And for each group, the low carb group and the low fat group, they plotted how individuals actually did. So on the aggregate, the weight loss in both groups was. Uh, at 12 months was about the same but within each group some people in low carb did really well some people not so well in low fat same thing some people responded really well some not so well and they were in that study trying to, to look they looked at a few different predictors so they were measuring insulin resistance and i think three different genes that are associated with obesity to see oh can we sort of predict who would be better go better on a low carb versus low fat based on insulin resistance or a certain gene and they couldn't so there were the 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 genes that they looked at anyway and i'm sure there's probably more than three and insulin resistance didn't predict who was successful and so i'm kind of left thinking about this data and i have a few questions and i'll kind of just throw this out there and get your thoughts but um the people that were successful say on low carb i wonder if they are just people that have certain behaviors and they would have also been successful on low fat and vice versa the people that did poorly on low carb because of certain emotional or behavioral social elements or perhaps genes that they weren't looking at would have done poorly on on both um i guess a couple of questions here that i have one is um, do we need to just all accept that each individual, an individual may do better on a particular macronutrient ratio. Some may do better on high carb, some may do better on low carb. Um, and secondly, what do you think may help explain? Yeah, I have some theories. Uh, you know, for example, I tend to thrive very well on a low carbohydrate diet with a caveat that I really thrived well on a relative, relatively low carb diet when my fats were also low, independent of calories. So I would have, well, I shouldn't say independent, but even if my calories were, you know, eucaloric between that's anecdotal. Uh, but I do respond very well to low fat. Uh, but from a lifestyle perspective, I adhere better to low carb. So it's quite interesting, a little bit of a conundrum there. Now, I do feel that personally, as a long distance runner growing up with lots of running under my belt, by the time I was you know, 13, I'd run multiple marathons and well over 20 half marathons. So I can't help but wonder if epigenetically, I conditioned my body to be very, very good at oxidizing fats. And that is a purely theory. Uh, but I've ran it through multiple people that are respected and they say, you know, that's a very valid theory, you know, especially like at a young age when epigenetically you can make a lot of changes. Am I an outlier where I just really thrived with it? And it would explain multiple, multiple things. It would explain why when carbohydrates were reduced, I would lose weight. And it would explain why when fats would reduce dietarily, it would kind of shift to my body oxidizing my onboard fats a little bit easier because it just knows how to use them better. And I've talked about this in content and sometimes it discourages people because they're like, oh, well, shoot, well, you're just an outlier. Well, no, I mean, it doesn't mean that it's not going to work for you. And it doesn't mean for sure that I'm an outlier. It's just a theory. 
But I do think that you're correct. I think that being able to uh, adhere is probably the most important thing. And I think that there, you know, when we look at the interesting data that we're seeing now on the region of the brain that fats tend to light up and activate, you know, we're talking more, um, a little more hippocampal, we're talking a little more things that are associated with sensation. And then with sugar, carbohydrates, your different region of the brain is a little more associated with, uh, with taste and a little more dopamine hit. So does our history dictate what is more appealing to us and or addictive, right? So it's like that we have our history, like how our brain is really operating. We have pure just fundamentals of just how we're wired that we can't change perhaps that makes it where maybe you are going to get addicted to fats easier and I'm going to get addicted to carbs easier. That's data we just don't know. And rather than maybe focusing on just constant weight loss trials, maybe we should be focusing on how our brains are impacted by various macronutrients. And but again, it's difficult. You know, you can't just take a large cohort of people and like how do you how do you divide those cohorts up to really get to the bottom of it? Yeah. And when I think of the two models, there was a paper written recently on the energy balance model and the carbohydrate insulin model. And this goes back to what you said at the start around often you can focus on the disagreement but there's actually some agreement irrespective of the kind of direction of causality so carbohydrate insulin model sort of suggests that fat storage occurs first and then that drives increased energy intake energy balance is that increased energy intake drives fat storage irrespective of the models both sets of researchers point to these um, high glycemic ultra processed foods as being the primary problem with the diets. And you kind of, you combine that and you've got uh, two regions of the brain that are getting activated, right? I can't help but look from an evolutionary perspective. Like if you had, how many foods in nature have high amounts of carbohydrate and fat together? Just not a lot of them. I mean, you can find them, but they're not like, insanely high amounts. So you're not going to like, there's not a whole lot of ultra fatty fruits. There's not a whole lot of, you know, it's just a very difficult situation. And I, so are we designed to be taking in high concentrated, not moderate amounts, but high concentrated amounts of carbohydrates and fat at the same time? Like, is that sort of our, is our operating system not really welcoming of that? That's a great point. That's often lost is that you can think of these ultra processed foods as purely high carb, but they're very often a high carb and high fat. Oh, almost always, almost mm. always. Mm.